Hi, and welcome to Finding Your Way Through Therapy, a proud member of the Sightcraft Network. The goal of this podcast is to demystify therapy, what can happen in therapy, and the wide array of conversations you can have in and about therapy. Through personal experiences, guests will talk about therapy, their experiences with it, and how psychology and therapy are present in many places in their lives, with lots of authenticity and a touch of humor. Here is your host, Steve Bisson. Salut mes amis. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 149 of Finding Your Way Through Therapy. If you haven't listened to episode 148, go back and listen. Uh, it's about only children, uh, the challenges, the good stuff, the bad stuff, what AI says about us. Uh, but please go back and listen. Courtney, Jen, and Brody were awesome. But episode 149 will be with two individuals that um, I'm working with, hopefully, on a regular basis very soon. Austin Ives is one of them, and Justin Jacobs is the other. They both work with MindStrong Guardians, and uh, we're going to be talking about uh, military support for mental health and how important it is. Uh, Let's talk about Justin. Justin is a retired Coast Guard officer that served 22 years in 45 different countries, lived on all four American coasts. And after retiring from the Coast Guard, Justin chose coaching as his next profession. It takes great joy in helping to unlock the true potential of individuals that have possibly have some restrictions in their success because of what they've done and ultimately makes them live their life to the fullest. He's also a father, lives in Springfield, Virginia, and has two sons, 17 and 27. And that's for Justin. Austin is a retired Coast Guard veteran with uh, PTSD and major depression disorder. I think he's going to talk about that, uh, largely stemming from his time at the CG Search and Rescue for over a decade. Through different therapies, medication, peer support, he's learned to live with those challenges and co-founded this business that we're going to talk about, My Strong Guardians, to innovate mental health tools for the military and everything else that goes with that, especially with first responders, which is, you know, near and dear to my heart. Today, Austin is joining us with his lived experience and as one of the three co-founders of this company. So I hope you enjoyed the interview. I think it's uh, going to be great. So here it is. Before we go to the interview, please listen to this very important message from free.ai. Getfree.ai. Yes, you've heard me talk about it previously in other episodes, but I'm going to talk about it again because getfree.ai is just a great service. Imagine being able to pay attention to your clients all the time instead of writing notes and making sure that the note's going to sound good and how are you going to write that note and things like that. Getfree.ai liberates you from making sure that you're writing what the client is saying because it is keeping track of what you're saying and will create after the end of every session a progress note. But it goes above and beyond that. Not only does it create a progress note, it also gives you suggestions for goals, gives you even a mental status if you've asked questions around that, as well as being able to write a letter for your client to know what you talked about. So that's the great, great thing. It saves me time, it saves me a lot of aggravation, and it just, speeds up the progress note process so well and for $99 a month I know that that's nothing that's worth my time that's worth my money you know the best part of it too is that uh, if you want to go and put in the code Steve 50 when you get the service at the checkout code is Steve 50 you get $50 off your first month and if you get a whole year you save a whole 10% for the whole year so again Steve 50 at checkout for getfree.ai will give you $50 off for the first month and like I said get a full year get 10% off get free from writing notes get free from always scribbling while you're talking to a client and just paying attention to your client so they win out you win out everybody wins and I think that this is the greatest thing and if you're up to a point where you got to change the treatment plan well the goals are generated for you so getfree.ai code Steve 50 to say $50 on your first month. Well, hi everyone. Welcome to episode 149. You know, this is an episode that's very important to me. Uh, You've heard a few episodes on first responders. You've certainly heard me talk about 
uh, the armed forces in particular also. And this is just an organization that, you know, I feel like very close to, and I'm not quite part of it yet, but we're hoping I will be part of it, and uh, the Mind Strong Guardians. And I have two great guests that are already part of Mind Strong Guardians. They want to talk a little bit about what they're doing, as well as a couple of more things. But welcome, uh, Justin Jacobs and Austin Ives. Welcome to Finding Your Way Through Therapy. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. What I, you know, I start off the show with two basic questions. The first question I ask everyone is how about you tell us a little bit about yourself? So how about we start with Justin on that one? Yeah, so a uh, 22-year Coast Guard veteran that got out in uh, 2022 and decided I couldn't work for anybody else ever again. So I uh, instead decided to go start my own business as a life coach and specifically uh, helping veterans both do their job better while they're in the service and then as they're getting out, helping them figure out how to transition successfully to the civilian world and find work that continues to want them to wake up in the morning. And so I've been doing that for about the past two years. That's great. And you're enjoying it so far? I think that it's exactly what I should be doing. I I love coaching. I love uh, helping people have light bulb moments. uh, And I, I get a lot of satisfaction out of seeing them grow through the process. Well, thank you for your service, number one. Number two, appreciate the coaching. The more coaches we have to help the mental health people, we're, we hopefully will bring that, that up a little later on, but that's so important. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Austin, how about you introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Steve. So I've been, uh, I've been married about 25 years, have two, uh, about to have two girls in college. And the, over the past 21 years, the Coast Guard had sent us all over, had uh, wonderful assignments on the Gulf Coast, East Coast, Great Lakes. But when I retired two years ago, it was with service-connected PTSD and, and major depressive disorder, all from my time in search and rescue over a decade ago that only surfaced about five months before retirement. Never even knew I was carrying this subconscious debt of emotional trauma for 10 plus years until I started to slow down, delegate things, prepare for retirement. And, um, you know, my therapist tell me that's when that creates space in the brain for all those repressed and internalized uh, emotions and experiences to come forward. And so, yeah, so it's been a, um, it's been a challenge these last two years, uh, been in different kinds of therapies. Um, as you alluded to, we started a, uh, a business called Mind Strong Guardians, which basically uh, models what peer support can look like for our audiences, which um, up until now has been mostly Coast Guard units. But uh, as Justin said, very directly applicable for first responders as well. And so that's what we've been been focusing on and kind of using our experience uh, in the Coast Guard, but also just with life to really help military and first responders improve mental health outcomes for their members. Welcome and thank you for sharing that. And thank you for your service. Also really appreciate it. As a therapist who's worked with trauma for many years, including with first responders, one of the things I kind of tell people, it's usually not the first trauma that screws you up. It's the 27th one. And I say 27 just by saying a number. And I also, when I have individuals who are getting ready to retire out of first responders or uh, the armed forces in general, I'm like, don't come to me six months prior. We got to start doing the work about a year before. And just because you need to prepare people for that, because it is a change. There's a lot of stuff that comes back about your service and, you know, not because of anything else, but, you know, you see a lot of screwed up stuff. And particular before the interview, we were having a pre-interview and you were talking about it. Maybe you can talk a little more about that either, or it doesn't matter who brings it up, but being a coast guard of all the armed forces, they're essentially the first responders of, you know, the DOD. Can you tell us more about why that that perception sometimes gets lost? Whoever wants to go, Justin. Uh, well, I'll I'll take I'll take a first stab just because it's front of my mind. But we 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 straddle we straddle this line. 
between military and, and first responders. And so we, we don't fall squarely into the military because Coast Guard also has civil law enforcement authority as well as a uh, military mission. And we're the only federal agency that straddles the, the line like that. So we don't fall squarely into the military because we are first responders. We don't fall squarely as first responders because we have a uh, we have military authorities as well. And so because of that, the Coast Guard really doesn't have its own kind of organization as do the other services, as do police, fire, fraternities, things like that, where we feel totally comfortable within our own space. Other organizations always welcome the little coasties in and say, yes, you can join us and be part of it. And, you know, <laughs> but we don't have our, we don't have our own. And it's because we kind of straddle this line almost as if we don't really know what side we're on, but I'll let Justin, go ahead, share your thoughts there. So that, that little no man's land area, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, the Coast Guard is a organization that was cobbled together in 1915 from uh, a half dozen or more uh, agencies that were separate at the time. And, you know, we've been under the Department of Treasury, Department of Transportation, now Department of Homeland Security. So nobody in the government really knows where we belong either. But, you know, I think first and foremost, we are a first responder organization. We do search and rescue. We do counter uh, migrant. We do counter drug. We have law enforcement authorities. We have, you know, uh, humanitarian missions. But when war starts, the Coast Guard's there. We've been in every war since the country was founded. And and so it's this difficult piece of each day we're going out and doing really difficult missions that lead to operational stress and trauma. We're also training for future wars to go alongside our DOD brothers and sisters and and fight when we need to fight. And so as a small organization that kind of has this difficult place of figuring out exactly who are we and where do we fit, we also are doing the job every single day and we're being exposed to stuff that we're not prepared to handle. Just like the first responders, you know, serving in EMT and fire and police. Yeah. You know, Steve, your, your question uh, or statement earlier about it, you know, it's not usually the the one and done trauma that really that really gets you. It's the twenty seventh. That's representative of of what Coast Guard's men and women are exposed to. So, my trauma is from doing thirty next of kin notifications, mm. and you know, some just being extremely difficult involving children. And uh, so, when you said twenty seven, I'm like, yeah, that's. That's spot on. And I think that that's what you were, you know, both both alluded to is that, you know, the operational stress. I like that word because it really is the operational stress that really just builds up, I think, in the long term. Um, you know, maybe if I could turn to you, Justin, a little bit, you know, talking about this operational stress and the stuff that you did in the Coast Guard, how did that prepare you to be a coach nowadays? Yeah, I think that the, the work that I did in the Coast Guard um, was a slightly different flavor from Austin's. So Austin responded to the bad thing after it happened. I tried to stop the bad thing from happening. And so I didn't have as many opportunities to get exposed to the operational stress that he did. But I worked alongside those folks. And when the really bad thing happened, you know, it's all hands on deck. We're all working together to try to respond to whatever emergency situation we're dealing with. But as a person who was kind of on the sidelines watching other people do that, I learned how I could step in and assist them and kind of be uh, a person to serve as a confidant or serve as a, another set of eyes to help them see things differently, to process them differently. And as I got into the, the coaching space, I realized that I did not know how to listen well. Uh, becoming a, a coach and going through the formal training and actually listening with the intent to hear what's not being said, the subtext, the stuff right. that's underneath the, you know, the surface helped me to realize that when folks are coming to you and telling you, oh, this is my problem, you know, I, uh, the bathroom remodel, um, it's been going on six months and, and I'm having trouble, you know, getting it to, to finish up. Well, maybe three to six sessions later, it's not the bathroom remodel. It's the fact that you can't stand your spouse. 
right <laughs> you know or 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 whatever else and so being a leader in the organization that helped me to respond to emergencies quickly helped me i think as a coach to listen more intently to what's really going on what's really the issue that we're talking about right now and then reflect that back to the person so that they could see it differently yes the reflective listening is so important and you know for the record, just for anyone who's listening to this podcast, most of the time, the presenting problem that people come in with is not what we would end up discussing by the third or fourth session. Most of the time, 95% of the time. Does it happen that it's straight up that? Sure. Regularly, it's not, you know. And my experience also, maybe you can speak to this too, Austin, is that, you know, someone came in with X, Y, Z due to being in the service or being uh, a first responder. Then it brings up, oh, but that story and that story and how that affected their life at home and things like that. So sometimes it's also what you present with is also bringing back up the 27 or so things that came from the past. I don't know if that's your experience, Austin, if that happened to you or. Oh. Yeah. Interesting. I was sitting at my desk one day, I was typing up an email at I think it was and um, I just started crying and kind of braced myself at my desk I'm like oh my gosh why am I crying I had no idea no idea why I was crying and then um, it was the next day I was mowing my lawn I started crying again no idea why and then that it started happening every day and then it started happening twice a day. And then the nightmares started coming every night. Very, very intense. And by this time, I had a pretty good idea of what was happening to me, although I still wasn't sure. Um, all the dreams focused around drowning and family, friends, my dog. It's like I even start I even started dreaming about individual cases and so I, I thought I knew what was going on and um, it got so, it got so bad, Steve, that, um, you know, I had the suicide ideations, I had the hallucinations and I finally called CG support, which is the Coast Guard's kind of primary organization where you, where, you know, you can call and be connected with a therapist or for a certain number of sessions and they, they have other services too, but I reached out and um, just crying so hard I could barely get the words out and describing what I was going through. And and the therapist um, who had specialty in trauma, she had a specialty in trauma, and she said she said it sounds like you're starting with PTSD and and depression. She said you need medical attention. So first thing tomorrow. I want you to go to the Coast Guard clinic and ask to see a doctor. And so that's how it started with me. And there were all, all kinds of symptoms and manifestations in between, you know, then and there. So I'm not sure that answered your question, Steve, but that's, no, that's how I think. About it, it absolutely did, because I think that the okay. other part, too, is, you know, and uh, this goes to a little bit of both of you, because I'm not in the service, obviously. One of the things that I've heard from my first service men and women that I've served um, as a therapist, they said the f making that phone call is one of the hardest things to do because it shows vulnerability. And when you're in the, the service, showing vulnerability is the kiss of death. Uh, no pun intended, I promise. Uh, but it, either, both of you, I want both of you to answer that question. Do you feel that that's probably one of the biggest barriers that people face when they have a mental health crisis or situation when they're in the services, particularly, we'll talk about the Coast Guard, obviously. Yeah, and in fact, that's one reason why we formed the company is to help to remove that stigma. It took us getting out of the organization and reflecting on our experience while in it to realize that once you join the Coast Guard and you get used to that that tempo of operations and that stress level, it becomes your new normal, but it's not normal. And if it's not addressed in the moment when you're experiencing that operational stress, it will turn into trauma. And then it could turn into what Austin had to go through as he started ramping down from that constant stress and that constant workload. And so one of the major focuses 
uh, of the work that we're trying to do is to make having mental health conversations as routine as talking about running around the track or doing push-ups and sit-ups, just another part of your, your overall health. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that with a, with a quick story. Um, before I, right before I retired and after I had been dealing with this um, for several months, I wrote a note to all my colleagues, so senior officer colleagues across the service. And there, there were probably 50 or 60 on the, on the note. But I just kind of came out to them and told them what I was going through uh, because we've all held the same kinds of jobs. And I wanted to give people a heads up that say, hey, this is a potential outcome for you as well. So, you know, while you're in, start taking care of your mental health. So I sent this note out. And within the next few months, I got just about a hundred responses because I asked, I asked those unit commanders to propagate the, the email. So it went to all kinds of people everywhere across the service, got about a hundred responses. If they were colleagues, they got back and said, Austin, I've, um, I've been in therapy for two years now, uh, off books. I don't, I don't want anybody to know about it. And so why were they telling me that they're admitting career fear? You know, so these are senior officers who are competing for really tough right. assignments, consequential assignments. And just as you said, no one wants to be viewed as vulnerable. They want, don't want to be known as having reached out themselves for help. Um, I also got emails from like very, very junior folks. E3 in one of our command centers wrote to me and said, sir, he was in the comms unit. He said, I really, I heard this, um, you know, heartbreaking Mayday call the other week and it's, it's really stuck with me. And, um, you know, he said, I've never heard a captain come out and talk about this stuff before, you know, and so I had a conversation with him. So there's, um, the, the stigma is real, although it's gotten better since Justin and I were in, it's gotten a lot better since we were in, but there's still a way to go. And the career fear is there. And even though the military in general has come out with guidance saying, hey, if you seek therapy, even if you're on medications, it's not, you won't lose your clearance over this. There's as many times as that's been communicated, there's still a, a steep misconception about that. The number of people that lose their clearance over mental health issues is uh, like a, it's a fraction of a percent it's it's very very right. small you know and i think of it as we talked about generational stuff i think that you look at the older generation that was a fear that was unfortunately valid in the time if you reached out for help it was not always seen as strong i could be wrong but that's what the older military personnel tell me and i don't mean old like 75 80 i'm talking about 45 50 um, we're not talking about old people per se. I just saying that older, and I and I think that that's changed. And I think that the one thing that you know, you know, I I can't wait to hear more about. You know, I know a lot about Mindstar Guardians, but I'd love to hear more. But one of my missions with most of my clients is I talk to them about you had a stress today. Let's work on it for the next couple of weeks so that it stays acute stress disorder and it doesn't stay with you for the rest of your life. You don't address it today, which is fine. You're going to talk about that 27 stressors bringing up the last 26. And I think that's an imagery that people can get behind. And I certainly talk about that with my clients. Yeah. the One of the things that we realize about our company is that as uh, non-therapists, you know, non-practitioners of mental health stuff, we can't come in and, and do therapy. What we want to do is we want to come in and we want to say, hey, we were in the organization that you're in now. We've lived the stress of that job. We're telling you now that if you don't talk about this with a professional, that it's going to bite you in the butt later in, in life. And so we're trying to, as easily as we can and as gently as we can, tell them that old bootstrap mentality is not sufficient anymore. You can't just tough it out. You've got to find a way that you can talk about this stuff with people you trust, professionals if they need to be, 
so that this doesn't happen to you. And, and all of the work that we're trying to do really is preventative. If you've reached a point where you've had a mental break, where you need to see the therapist, go see that expert right now. Go see that professional, because that's not us. But just to uh, kind of emphasize the point of operational stress and trauma, several years ago, the Coast Guard partnered with the, the VA and several major universities, and they did a study of mental health outcomes at Coast Guard boat stations. I think we have, uh, what do we have, Justin? But we have about 160 or 180 boat stations. I, I forget. Sounds but, right. Um, it was across a wide swath of, of boat stations. And that's where the rubber meets the road for your audience. That's where the search and rescue happens. That's where the a lot of the uh, migrant interactions happen. So hurricane response, things like that. And to sum up, what the researchers found was that serving at a Coast Guard boat station has similar comparable mental health outcomes to those of larger military services returning from combat deployment. So no one ever tells you that when you <laughs> when you join. Um, so that was that was a mic drop moment for me. As all this was was coming out and manifesting, I started doing some some research and reading just to educate myself on what was happening. And I found this study, legit study, and um, I was like, "Oh my gosh!" Similar comparable mental health outcomes to those returning from combat deployment, and so that I think that drives home the the importance of reaching out when when you need to. Or even be even beforehand. <laughs> I mean, it, I'll tell you as a this is not necessarily the mission of you guys, but I'll tell you my mission as a human being and part of why I do this <laughs> podcast and why I do my job is one day I want it to be that you have a physical a year and you go see your mental health counselor once a year. Even if everything's going great, you just go see him. Hey, everything's good. Everything's fine. Great. See you in a year. And that's my goal in life so that we make it as common as it is for a physical. When you go for a physical, no one goes, oh, my God, I got to go for a physical. No, they just go to a freaking physical. I want one day to go, oh, yeah, it's my time to go see the shrink. Even if you use pejorative terms, and I don't care, shrink is not pejorative to me, but for some people it is. Oh, I got to go see my shrink. Believe me, I'm always happy because people come in and they go, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. It's been six months. I, I just can't. Coming in for my oil change. Perfect. How's, how's the oil? It's pretty good. Blah, blah, blah. Great. See you in the six months to a year. Um, and I think that that's a little bit of the mission that I hear from you guys, that basically we need to break down the stigma, but also normalize that mental health is as important as physical health. And that's why I love this company overall, personally. To elaborate on that, Steve, we, we kind of created an analogy. Um, most people, you know, in the first responder communities have, have heard of, uh, personal protective equipment, PPE, yeah. right? And so militaries and, and Coast Guard included normally do a very good job at providing our service members PPE to protect their physical well-being. So we give our Marine inspectors four gas meters. Um, we give our boarding teams Kevlar and you know, helmets for the boat crew and, and just all these different things to protect their physical uh, being. But what do we really do to prepare them? I'm speaking about all military now. What do we do to prepare members for the, the mental aspect? What mental PPE do we provide to our service members? That can prepare you for outcomes like those of larger services returning from combat deployment, like, like we just said. Um, and so I think the services are, in general, um, they've struggled with that in the past. I think it's gotten a lot better in, in recent history. The um, mental PPE. I think that mental P PPE will be very good, and I like that analogy. I'll probably steal that from uh, you guys if that's okay. Well, since I hopefully will be part of Please you do. guys, I guess yeah. I will not be stealing anything. I'll be part of the mission. Yeah. Uh, but um, all joking aside, I mean, like, you know, we talked a lot about my, you know, MindStrong Guardians. 
and we talked about a little bit of where you guys are working and what you want to do, but how did it evolve to this point? I mean, you just didn't wake up one day and say, this is going to be a great idea. Let's do it because this is not a one night. Like I, I, I don't like when people think about everything as uh, overnight success or overnight ideas, because there's no such thing in my opinion. So maybe both of you can talk a little bit to that evolution and how we got to a point where and I, I know that you there's been events in March and April that you have 2024 that you've just participated in. So I would love to hear a little more about that evolution. So I'll, I'll, I'll start and bring us up to a point and then uh, kick it over to, to Justin. So I you know Steve, I mentioned um, all this started to manifest for me five months before retirement. I spent the last five months uh, of active duty, basically in bed, on meds, in therapy, very isolated. But I, during that time, I, I had time for re reflection. And, um, you know, I thought this, uh, and after I learned I wasn't alone from sending out that email, and I'm getting those responses, I thought, my gosh, like, I have to do something to, to let people know this is a potential outcome of the very, very tough jobs the nation asks us to do. And so I uh, started talking to some colleagues and we had a fam fabulous commander up in up in Anchorage, Alaska, where, where Justin served for several years. And uh, she's very forward leaner. Her, uh, her name was Leanne Lusk. She's um, an advisor to us now. And she invited me up to Anchorage to talk about my experience of this kind of cumulative emotional trauma that had built up over time for me. And so we put together a panel and on the panel, we also had a PhD psychologist. We had the unit chaplain. We had um, two others call in, one of whom was um, our primary therapist now, uh, Blythe Landry. And um, and so we had this discussion for a few hours up in Anchorage, Alaska, and it was very well received. And so then thinking to myself, okay, there's something to this. Having a conversation about this topic is a lot different than new policy or new training. There's got to be something in between there that can really make a difference. And it's having these lived experience conversations. And that's what kind of solidified it in my mind. After that, I was hired to speak to is either six or seven different Coast Guard units. And so we put together these panels, similar to what we did in Anchorage. And uh, again, I'd talk about a lived experience and the uh, therapist would kind of comment from his or her disciplinary lens and experience. And I did that for a, about a year. And then is when I linked up with Justin and our other partner, Steve. And we considered incorporating as a not-for-profit organization to, to take this further. But we didn't want to cannibalize support that was already being given to the Coast Guard through through different means. And um, we actually got some, some very sage advice for one of our uh, former commandants, uh, Admiral Thad Allen, who said, oh, have you considered being a for-profit? And we really hadn't even considered that. And um, I think from there, I'll maybe hand it over to, to Justin on how we went about this. Yeah. So all told, um, I'd say the, the process has been about two years in the making. So Austin was my last boss in the Coast Guard. He actually retired me out uh, in May. Yeah. Uh, and then the week after I got out, now that I wasn't his uh, subordinate anymore, he decided I could be his friend. Before that, he was kind of a tight ass. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so we went out for a beer and he shared the story with me uh, of what he was going through. And as I had been in uh, training to become a coach, I was kind of in this whole mental awareness, mental attitude, headspace of, you know, how do you have conversations about these things? How do you listen intently? How do you help somebody process what they're going through? And um, we were having conversations about, well, how does he go get a job if he can't even get through an interview? And, you know, he was sharing a lot of 
deeply personal stuff with me. And I'm sorry if I'm kind of speaking out of turn now, Austin, but I felt like we were kind of, we were working together on trying to see how can we help what he's going through now be of benefit to others in the future. And, and coming up with this idea of like, well, let me go share my story as a cautionary tale with folks who are doing the work now. So they don't have to go through what I'm going through. Took about 18 months to materialize into programs where we go and he shares that experience with a clinician who can explain Mm -hmm. how the brain and the body are taking this stress and turning it into trauma. And then that's, you know, turning into illness. And then in the afternoon, after sharing that story, turning that into how can we as lay people in this organization have conversations about mental health in a way that helps us to process the day-to-day activities we're all experiencing and maybe even help to identify like, hey, Joe and, you know, or Jill aren't doing so hot. Maybe it's time for us to intercede, have a conversation with them, and then refer them out to a professional if that's what they need. And so, yeah, in March, uh, we were able to go and do that, and we got great feedback because what most people said was it's about time we start having these conversations. We've been wanting something like this for years, but nobody knew how to do it. And it's not death by PowerPoint. It's not sitting in a classroom for eight hours just being fed a bunch of, you know, technical jargon. It's people sharing real, visceral, difficult stories about their experience in in the organization such that people are like, yeah, that's exactly the way I feel. Finally, somebody's telling me something that I I understand. And and I'll just quickly add to that. We don't necessarily focus on the, the trauma itself. I mean, we do we do discuss it because we explain what we've experienced and we share that, but that's probably 15% of what we discuss. The, the, the rest is, you know, the, how we reached out for help, because normally when you sit through one of these, you know, other types of presentations, you, you get, these are the five ways to be resilient. And these are the six ways to do this. And these are the numbers to call. This is how you reach out for help, but you never hear, hear from somebody who actually picked up the phone and and what their thoughts were as they were dialing the number. And so we really, that's the kind of lived experience that we really talk about. And then um, your experience in different types of therapies and, you know, how you developed your own coping strategies and, you know, how did you apply kind of strengths-based healing techniques and um you know what are your what are some of your lessons learned for others and the organization so even though it is a very serious conversation and the part that discusses trauma can be intense that's the beginning and then we start talking really it's it's more about post traumatic growth and and recovery i like that a lot and um I remember one of my military people once said to me, if you, you know, you worked in the military when everything is six points to blank or eight points to, bl- there's always a number somehow attached to something instead of real life, real example and real stuff. So I uh, wanted to mention that because you were talking about the six points of resiliency and all that. That's, that's not only death by PowerPoints, death by numbers but that's the military for you and i'm not putting down the military by any stretch i understand it's a hard thing but i always find it funny when i hear numbers it's like it's the only organization that works like with numbers all the time instead of like how about resiliency let's talk about it now what they do even better is take a word like resiliency and turn it into an acronym and then give you you know all the words that come off of resiliency (laughs) (laughs) that sounds about right actually yeah well gentlemen i know that you know this has been going really well like i said you know kudos to you guys what's the long-term vision for you guys do i know we didn't put this into questions but it's like kind of like are we are we just doing this for the coast guard on for one year or are we thinking about long term and expanding it or what what's the goals for you guys yeah it's a great question thank you for asking um the vision is to build almost like now use a military analogy, almost like deployable teams 
where whether it's military or first responders, we envision being able to construct a, a panel engagement, which involves the lived experience discussion and some practical workshops that Justin leads in the afternoon. So it's a it's a day event, and of course there are breaks and, and lunch and things, but you know, we envision having different teams being out at different times, putting on these engagements for different military and first responder organizations. And the the unique thing about our construct is, you know, I am not the only peer with a lived experience. Right. So if if we were to do a firefighting organization. We would do our prep work and identify a firefighter with that same type of operational stress and trauma. We have a process where our clinician vets peers to make sure it's safe for them to present. And so we, we have this vetting procedures and we have, what's the word I'm looking for? Protocols, I'm sorry, protocols. And so we envision almost like a plug and play. So we're in the process now of building up a cadre of different types of peers, screening them, training them, getting ready to deploy them and pair them with different clinicians or chaplains or, you know, whoever it may be um, to, to go and address uh, operational stress and trauma wherever it wherever it lies really and so yes we've started with the coast guard because that is our organization from which all uh, three of us the three co-founders came from so it's uh kind of focused on coast guard right now and you know we have boat stations we have cutters we have air stations we have specialties we have you know we have all these different types of units many different types of units so there's a lot of work to be done in the Coast Guard. And then, of course, you have all the DOD services. And then, you know, you talk about police departments, fire departments across the U.S. You know, there are other DHS agencies as well, Customs and Border Protection, and, you know, even State Department. You know? right. and so there's uh, there's a lot of work to be done, but that's kind of the the grand vision that we have these impactful conversations kind of on demand where needed with the right peers that have been screened and trained with an outstanding clinician to kind of facilitate these conversations and workshops. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Justin. No, I, I think that's, that's right. And you may, maybe just to wrap it up, it's, it's the protocol allows us to take somebody with street credibility in that organization and place them in a, a position to tell their story supported by a clinician and a facilitator so that that audience says, oh, this person does the work that I do. I know them personally. I can't believe that this is their story. I've never heard it before, probably, um, but it's exactly what I feel like. It's exactly what I've yeah. experienced. It's relatable. Because, yeah, a fire fire department, uh, the Marine Corps, any other organization would rather listen to, to somebody from their organization than some guy from the Coast Guard, right? And and so our business is trying to use the best of all resources to maximum effect when we go in to talk to that organization. I think that that's what I wanted to make sure that everybody heard because that's a very important part. Um, I have many jokes I can make about the Coast Guard and Marines and stuff like that, but I'm going to hold off those for now. We've heard them all, Steve. I know, but, you know, we've we got to be all. respectful here. I mean, we want the Marines to buy into it first, and I'm going to hold off on that joke that I wanted to add to that. But anyway, uh, point being is I think that one of the most important things and why the reason why I'm so excited to have at least, you know, hopefully a part in this in organization in the long term is that lived experience from people who have been there, done that, have a few t-shirts and can tell you from that perspective is probably more important to me than some therapist who goes, you know what, this is what PTSD is compared to acute stresses. Yeah, it's nice to have that experience, but having someone tell you what the real life experience was and how that therapist, counselor, whatever you want to call them, can contribute to 
the wellness coaching, obviously, I don't want to forget about coaching, but the wellness of those individuals, that's where I feel like my complimentary support will be helpful, but a real life experience, there's, there's nothing like it. Yeah. 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 We, we need the person who is uh, able to explain what that person's story means you know, as you're saying, it's like, this is what stress does to the body. This is what stress does to the brain. This is the reason why so-and-so reacted the way that they did. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, that that makes a lot more sense because I heard the story and then I heard the explanation of why they responded the way they did rather than just a PowerPoint slide that says, stress does this to the body. Well, so what? Let, let me go do my job. Right. Well, the great thing about where we're at now, we're no longer talking about the was it a 500 yard glare or whatever they used to call it before we gave it a real name. Hmm. Um, hmm. And I think that you guys are just going to, you know, you're, you're just starting, but I can see great things coming and the whole vision is there. And obviously you already know this. We've had private conversations about this, but anything I can do to contribute, I'm more than happy and humble to do so. And I really want to thank you for your time today. I really want to thank you for this mission. And how can people find the mindful uh, guardians or mind strong guardians? I'm sorry. Sorry, my, the therapist in me kicked in. I'm sorry. Mind strong guardians. Go ahead, Justin. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we're on LinkedIn. Uh, we've got a page, Mind Strong Guardians. And then also our website is www.mindstrongguardians.com. And uh, we're not out on social networks yet. We're not that cool. But uh, yeah, well, maybe you're too you cool for it. Yeah, that, that's right. We're too cool. For it. <laughs> well, gentlemen, thank you very much. Looking forward to uh, having more interactions with you. And please, guys, go go check out MindStrongGuardians.com. Uh, very, very important stuff going on right now. So thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you, Steve. Well, this concludes episode 149. Austin, Justin, thank you so much for your time. Can't wait for you guys to go to mindstrongguardians.com and see what we're doing and what they're doing. I'm not officially part of the company. I shouldn't say we, but episode 150 is coming up and 150 will be with Lee in. And then we're, I'm not going to give too much Lee in and she, she's going to be talking about something we're going to be doing in Worcester very soon, uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. So please listen to my episode then. Please like, subscribe, and follow this podcast on your favorite platform. A glowing review is always helpful. And as a reminder, this podcast is for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only. If you're struggling with a mental health or substance abuse issue, please reach out to a professional counselor for consultation. If you are in a mental health crisis, call 988 for assistance. This number is available in the United States and Canada.